This KJZZ podcast series is supported by AARP Arizona, keeping Phoenix in motion with events to get out and do more things with your friends and family. Discover all the real possibilities here in the community on Facebook at AARP Arizona or aarp.org slash phoenix. This is The Recovering Caregiver. I'm Kathy Ritchie. I spent several years taking care of my own mom who had frontotemporal degeneration, a lesser known type of dementia. Her disease could manifest in the most excruciating ways. Behaviors like apathy, making inappropriate comments, or loss of inhibition are some of the hallmarks of FTD. So is loss of language. My mother eventually lost everything. She was no longer in control of herself. Her gray matter was being attacked and there was nothing I could do. Then, eight years after she started to change, she fell out of bed. That was the beginning of the end for her. It would be another two long, painful years before she died. There was a funeral, friends and family came to say goodbye, then nothing. Everyone went back to their lives, and I was left to figure out mine. This is Life After Dementia, and I am a recovering caregiver. When I think about older people having sex, I think about Blanche Devereaux from the popular 80s NBC sitcom, The Golden Girls. She played the always stylish flirt who regularly enjoyed the company of men. This nightgown is so sheer, I believe you can see right through it. Hello, Fidel. Hello, Blanche, how are you? You don't have cataracts, you tell me. What I love about Blanche and the other women she lived with, Dorothy, Sophia, and Rose, was that they were not defined by their age. They were dynamic and multifaceted, and they all had intimate relationships with men. Thing is, that's not weird. How we respond to older people having sex is weird. We get uncomfortable. I think Marianne McCarthy, a geriatric and psychiatric nurse practitioner who I talked to about this issue in 2017, summed up society's bias perfectly. So that term sexually inappropriate makes me just a little bit crazy because we're defining things as inappropriate based on whatever, you know, whether they're our puritanical values or just the whole idea that women become neutered when we get older. You know, men, if they're sexual beings, they're thought of as dirty old men. Well, in this podcast, women and men are sexual beings until the day they die. Oh, and they might have more than one sexual partner in their lifetime. Mind blown. But it's complicated. In this episode of The Recovering Caregiver, let's talk about sex, dating, and dementia in no particular order. The two people we're going to meet have wrestled with those very issues, including one issue you probably haven't considered unless you're watching the Netflix series Grace and Frankie, dating while the person you love is still alive. My name is Carol Safford. Um, Been here for 29 years with my partner of 38 years. Her partner is Martha, and she had Alzheimer's disease. Martha passed away last November. Carol and I spoke a couple of months before that. Uh, It makes for an interesting life. I have four support groups I go to, two are weekly, uh, caregiver support group and grief before loss, which my life depends on now because those are people who understand exactly where I am. And then one a month for both spouses and grief at Silverado that I go to once a month. Silverado is a facility where Martha lived. When Carol and I first met, she was in this transitional space. Martha was physically present, but psychologically absent. It's something Dr. Pauline Boss talks about in her book, Loving Someone Who Has Dementia. Carol was feeling lonely. Martha was in the final stages of her illness. She barely recognized Carol, and that give and take of love and affection that most couples enjoy was pretty much gone. And suddenly, I have no clue what to do with my life. And I'm 76, I woke up and I'm older than most of the people I'm associating with. And usually I was the youngest for the longest time. And I'm not used to that. Uh, It's like someone getting a divorce or have a death in the family. They wanna go out and date. Uh, 
I'm not sure what I'm doing is dating. I am calling people, I'm having dinner, I'm learning, relearning how to play billiards. You heard that right. Carol is stepping way out of her comfort zone and kind of sort of dipping her toe into the proverbial waters with a female friend. As a matter of fact, I shared the fact that we've had dinner and billiards with our Grief Before Loss group yesterday. So obviously, it's not something I'm hiding. Do you think about her? Off and on, but... Martha's still alive, though. Martha is still alive. Is that hard for you? Do you feel like it's, it's a... No, um, first of all, you can screw guilt. I've done everything in my power to take care of this woman and have her as comfortable and as safe, as loved, and as engaged as she can. What has happened that's got me confused that has never happened to me before, not to me, of and by myself, I was hit over the head with falling in love with somebody that doesn't return it because I've talked to them about it. So now what do I do? How do I let go of something I have never had possession of? Are we talking about the woman that you play billiards with no, from time to time no, or Martha? We are not. No, we are not. We are not talking about Martha. We're talking about a completely different person. And it came from out of the blue about four months ago. Oh, Took back me, up, yeah, back up. Yeah. So this is a totally different person. Totally different person, and it has, like, the rug's been yanked right out from underneath me. I don't know how to deal with it. And I see this person from time to time, and uh, I have behaved myself. I have to be very, very careful not to impose my dream on her life because she's point blank told me she doesn't roll my way. But I still want to be able to have a friendship, and, and we enjoy doing things together. So I have to be really careful. And it- That's really- uh, Very confusing. Confusing and complicated. Yes, it so is. So she's not gay. No. <laughs> <laughs> no nope. problem. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> Just let it go. And the problem I'm having is letting go of something I never had. Carol had a crush on someone who wasn't gay, and Martha was still alive. But the thing is, falling for someone else while your loved one with dementia is still alive isn't unusual. That's life and dementia. Nothing goes the way you planned, including falling for someone who maybe makes you happy. I get that this is something a lot of people are going to struggle with. It's not an easy thing to wrap your head around. but. Is this really cheating? A lot of people are very judgmental about the whole scenario, knowing very little about the fact that, you know, I lost my wife nine years ago. Walt Doyle's wife, Erin, had early onset Alzheimer's disease. She was 52 when she was diagnosed. Walt and Erin had a very passionate relationship before her illness set in. We always used to laugh. You know, we made great love. But as this started to evolve, you went from making love to sex to nothing. That's Walt from a 2017 interview I did with him about aging and intimacy. Erin eventually started to forget who her husband was. Walt told me a story about a time when Erin woke up in the middle of the night. She got out of bed and started screaming at him. She thought Walt was a stranger. About eight months before Erin passed, Walt realized he was really lonely. He wanted companionship. Well, I went uh, through the standard friends, getting referrals, if you will. <laughs> Going 30 years and being happy and really having a what I considered a, a perfect situation, your standards are very high. Trying to find people that were just happy with themselves was a challenge. So um, I had zero luck with the friend referrals. Um, so I went on Match. Dot com, the online dating site. And uh, that was an adventure, to say the least. <laughs> what was the, um, what was your reaction when you got onto Match.com after all, you know, more than 25 plus years of being married to somebody where I'm sure when you met Aaron, it was <laughs> through different channels? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was, uh, it was very automated. It was, it was different. I mean, um, I really didn't have any precursor of what it was going to be about because I had no idea. I mean, everybody saw the commercials, but, you know, until you get involved in it, you do it. And when he did it, it didn't exactly go the way he had hoped. 
Did you tell some of the women that you chatted with that you were married and that your wife was still alive? I initially did uh, because everybody proposed that they wanted honesty and total clarity and and everything like that. And um, uh, the first three women that I went out with, uh, I did share that information with them and was promptly told that I was a cheater and that I was, uh, how could I do that and how dare I? And she was in a moment of need and, you know, I was ignoring her. That's got to be very hurtful to hear something, to be accused of being a cheater. Well, it was. I mean, it was, especially knowing that, you know, everything that I had done up to this point, which they had no knowledge of and was not given an opportunity to explain any of that. Walt eventually clicked on someone who he clicked with. But after what happened with the other women on Match.com... I did not tell her that my wife was still alive. I did choose to tell her that she had already passed. You lied to her. Yeah, I did. I did. Uh, I had I had to make a decision uh, because the the openness initially wasn't working at all. Uh, I was only interested in going out and having some fun and meeting some people, and I never expected this to evolve into where we are. You know, three years later, two and a half years later. When did you uh, finally have to come clean? Uh, after Aaron's funeral. They also had had sex. Yeah, not how he had hoped things would play out. And honestly, I feel for Walt. I get where he's coming from, but the way she found out, well, he'll tell you. Well, it didn't take for me to get back. Being as efficient as she is, and I often laughingly tell her that she could probably work for the CIA. She was doing research because she felt that there was something odd about me leaving town like this and going back to address some things, and she pulled up my wife's obit. Um, Ooh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I was in the midst of traveling between the funeral parlors and the church and having people come into town, and uh, she started texting me, uh, you know, justifiably infuriated, and about the lying and things like that. And she had had a, a, a past spouse that had cheated on her, which exasperated the situation. They eventually talked, but during that time between her texts and his phone call. She had started to do some research about Alzheimer's and caretakers and spouses dating while spouse was still alive, what was entailed and why they did it and things like that. And she did a tremendous amount of research in that six hour window. And she got it. She also forgave him. But it's not like Aaron is gone. Walt and Aaron had two now adult children together, and Walt still has his memories and his moments. Does it ever feel like there are three of you in this relationship? Well, interesting question. No. Is there comparisons? Yes. Has that been a struggle? Yes. And it's something I've been wrestling with really at great length over the last year. Because, you know, when you have something so good, you want to repeat it. But that's not fair to the other party because it's not the same party. And and I guess, you know, thank God for therapy. I have a tendency to use the phrase, the phrase it should be. Why isn't this the way it was? It should be like this because. And my therapist said to me, well, it isn't should. It's now at this stage of your life, what do you want it to be? And boy, did the light click on. Walt wants it to be good. He knows it won't be like it was with Aaron, and that's okay. But it can still be something wonderful, just different. But perhaps more importantly, Walt wants to be with Cassie. That's his girlfriend's name, Cassie. He wants to have a life with her. For both Walt and Carol, what happened to their respective spouses wasn't the plan. You know that saying, man plans, God laughs? That's dementia. But throwing in sex and dating and the emotions that can go with it makes everything way more complicated, which probably means we have to talk more about this because it's not going away. You can't stop dementia, you can't cure it, but we can reframe how we look at the myriad issues surrounding it and those after our loved one is gone, like ambiguous loss, grief, death, and sex.
For more about life after caregiving, including all of my conversations with recovering caregivers, download more episodes at podcasts.kjzz.org or on iTunes. I'm Kathy Ritchie, and thanks for listening to this episode of The Recovering Caregiver.